Remember joining? Yes, welcome, Honorable Mabu. How are you, Anele? Thank you very much. I'm good, and you, Honorable Mabu? I'm good, I'm good, I'm good, yes. Good, good, good to see you. Perfect, perfect, thank you. Okay. <laughs> Why are you doing this? <laughs> no, I'm just <laughs> fixing my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, okay, 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 okay. Now it's still fine. Oh. Okay. <laughs> Anele. Hi, Nutanda. Um, some of my members will join us later, and they are in another meeting. But it's oh. supposed to it's supposed to adjourn at six. All right. But uh, the chairperson is here. Mm-hmm. Uh, and one of my members. All right. Yeah. All right. Okay. Oh. Mm. Anele? Anele, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you, Chair. Okay. Uh, the members coming in. I have, I have about four for now. Uh, Honorable Etsie, Manani, So, Nobo, and Honorable Poshoff. Okay. The entities? Yes, we, we do have this, the administrator, we do have the CEO of CHE as well as SACWA, as well as the respective chairpersons. Okay. And then from the NCOP side, um, uh, we have Honorable Nchabileng and Honorable Para. I've heard that some other members will join us a little bit later on. Okay. Okay, no, it's fine then. We'll 
start exit at six o'clock. I've lost I've lost my chairperson. I don't know what happened. Uh maybe it's the connection. Okay. <clears throat> okay, I think we should start. I think we should start with the meeting. <clears throat> May I please uh, just request all participants to mute their mics uh, so that there are no disturbances when we start. Uh, how many members do we have, Anele? Yes, uh, we have Honorable Letsie, Honorable Mananiso, Honorable Ngobo, Honorable Boshoff, Honorable Gates from the High Education Committee. Okay, from the NCOP. So, from the NCOP, I see um, Honorable Chabiling, Honorable Para, and Honorable Christian. Okay. But there's also Honorable Lutuli. Okay. All right, so we. <clears throat> We do form a quorum, uh, so we can proceed. Honorable Nchaveling, uh, good afternoon, Chair. Are you in the house? Chairperson. Hello. Honorable Nkadra and Notata are also here. Okay. All right, thank you, Great Vip. Um, I wanted to check Honorable Nchavele in the chairperson of the committee. I, in this. Yeah, I just... Okay. Chairperson, I've just joined the meeting now. Um, we, we jumped out of a meeting now of health. Uh, and I'm waiting for other members to leave that meeting to join this one. 
we've been in meeting from 12 o'clock until now so oh, we really okay. spent yeah they will they will they will join us they are leaving that meeting okay they are leaving the meeting now. thanks chair all right thank you so you don't mind if i proceed with the meeting honorable chavele yes please we okay thank you very much um welcome welcome honorable members uh, and welcome uh, the administrator of nsfas and your team uh, the chair of the commission on higher education you're welcome as well as the chairperson of uh, sakwa and your team you are all welcome um I am not sure whether the deputy minister is in the house or the minister, um, but I have not received an indication that they have joined us. So <clears throat> it's fine. We will pro then proceed, members. If you remember, uh, I think we met with the three entities about two weeks back. Uh, there wasn't enough time for for them to respond to all the questions. So we agree that we're going to have an hour, an hour and a half maximum to conclude this meeting. So hence we are meeting again today. <clears throat> I have seen that uh, a commission, was it the Commission on Higher Education or SACO? Uh, there is written responses to all the questions that have been raised, but I'm still going to give them an opportunity just to to summarize the responses. But I must confirm that we did receive those uh, responses, and we're very grateful for that. Um, so we will start in the absence of any other thing. Uh, we will then uh, start with the. Uh, uh, the administrator of NSFAS, uh, Dr. Karolison. Um, thank you. Thank you, Chairperson. Uh, good evening, honorable members. Uh, good evening, Chairperson of the NGOP as well. Uh, colleagues, uh, thank you for the opportunity to respond. Uh, we have submitted a, a PowerPoint as requested by the committee, um, and I hope that it can be flashed up. Uh, so I'm going to go through this uh, PowerPoint uh, because I want to stay to the questions that were put and respond to them exactly the way they were put to us. Uh, I'm not sure whether the committee secretary can, can put that on. Uh, Anele, are you able to share that presentation with us? Okay, let me look for Richard. Okay. All right, whilst Anel is looking for it, Doc, I think you can proceed. Okay. So, uh, on slide one, we have just for the... Okay. Hey, what's happening now? Okay. Somebody else's mic is on. Okay, it sounds, sounds better now. Uh, so thank you, Chair. Uh, so on slide one, we have just detailed the irregular expenditure as we reported on it in, a, in the annual report. Um, and you will recall that, the, and that it amounts to 7.58 billion rand that we reported. Now, underlying all that irregular expenditure was 440,000 records. I should also add that this irregular expenditure, the major part of that was exactly the reason why NISFAS was placed under administration. One of the reasons why NISFAS was placed under administration was specifically the disbursements with respect to NOCLA. I'll explain that in a minute. The shifting of earmark funds uh, and disbursement of in excess of contract amounts. Um, and on slide one, you will see, therefore, that uh, the, the different amounts is about 2 billion rand for shifting of earmark funds. Is, uh, um, the second category, disbursement with respect to NOCLA, is 4.3 billion, and disbursement in excess of contract amounts is 1.2 billion. So we have received, the, uh, we have done a full uh, analysis of this 440,000 records, and since administration, we have worked it down to about 200,000, slight, slightly more than 200,000. 
We have a special team on board to complete that exercise to make sure that the 2018, 19 and 2017, 18 financial years are totally cleared. But whilst we we were doing that, we were also instituting controls for that not to happen. So in category A, which is the irregular expenditure with regards to the shifting of earmark funds, that's uh, our explanation there. This was a case of erroneous approval. And the erroneous approval, I've just moved on to the next slide, please. The erroneous approval was done by the previous board. They did not receive the correct um, approval to move that money around. Uh, we have written to National Treasury to ask for a condonement. National Treasury was not uh, willing to condone because they say it's a retrospective condonement. So I'm drafting a letter to the minister to have this written off um, because it was an erroneous approval. Uh, and so that category of irregular expenditure will be dealt with and it will be cleaned before the next uh, Auditor General. And as I said, I should probably add, we are in discussion with this all the time with the Auditor General. The category B, which is the disbursement with respect to NOCLA. Now, NOCLA is a finding raised by the Gen uh, Auditor General as well as by our internal audit, which is quite serious. It means that the organization is not able, or then was not able, to account properly for, uh, for these transactions. So it, 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 it links to issues of, uh, of poor master data setup, lack of management standards and processes, lack of access control, lack of uh, management of loans and bursary rules not being implemented and being enforced. So in that category, the remedial actions that we have taken on the, on the next slide, uh, it says category B action, um, the N plus rules and course codes have now been clarified. Um, so institutions can no longer fund outside of those course codes. And the N plus rules are clarified in the rules and guidelines of DHGT. Uh, automated validations have been developed and implemented. And this has reduced the data anomalies in the NISFA system. The disbursement process has been mapped and documented and process and authorization control strengthened in order to reduce the likelihood of errors. And the NISFAS wallet process has been automated and man intervention in this process has been reduced. Now, on this particular category, it should be borne in mind that we are still working with the ICT system of the past. Uh, and we have on many occasions pointed out that a complete redevelopment of that system is required to make it fit for purpose. But we are satisfied that we have implemented the necessary controls to continue to work over the short to medium term with the quarters and, uh, um, and the system that it's linked to. Uh, so what I'm actually saying is that the approval system is different from the disbursement system, and therefore you have to build in all sorts of checks in between the, the two systems to make sure that you don't, um, they don't disperse to the wrong people. So the NOCLA findings have been cleared to a large extent by our additional governance and controls that we've built into the system. We have also made sure that the master data setup have been formalized. Uh, the ability to make data changes has been restricted and we have implemented audit logs. Now, audit log means that we can trace whatever intervention anybody has done on the system. Uh, in the past, that was not non-existent. Um, so we have also made sure that uh, we have reactivated our fraud outlines, what is independent and what is managed by a specialist team of call center agents. I think overall in this particular category, Chair, I'm very happy to report that we have now employed a number of technical experts, which previously was lacking in the, in, in the NISFAS environment. Uh, in fact, the NISFAS uh, ICT management, the top structure, had no ICT qualifications, and we have corrected that, or we are in the process of correcting that. Category C, disbursements in excess of contract amounts, uh, what is interesting here is that uh, for those two years, uh, we had disbursed uh, contract, contracted amounts, which was ridiculous in many cases, uh, very low values of like 15 rand or 2 rand and all of that. But what, was, what happened was that the actual correct amounts were disbursed to students. But because the correct amounts did not agree to the contracted amounts, the Auditor General raised a finding on that. Um, and so we have corrected that now, and we are strengthening that process to make sure that that does not happen anymore. So we are now dispersing according to the correct contract amounts. 
and we are busy clearing all of that. We have a third category, which is to say other at the moment. Um, we found as we were working through this irregular expenditure that there was investments in non-approved investment facilities. Um, we have put that as part of our forensic or, uh, investigation. And we have now a formal investment policy which, which, will inve which will make sure that government funds or surplus funds are only invested in terms of the national treasury regulation. Um, and that, that was um, uh, category D. The question of consequence management implemented against employees and syndicates involved in fraudulent activities. Uh, all cases of suspected fraud, both employees and syndicates, have been handed over to the Commercial Crime Unit of the SAPS. We have done extensive analysis in this respect, uh, and we have mapped a number of networks to check for subpoena bank accounts, and neither does NISFAS have the power to do lifestyle audit. We have handed that over to the Commercial Crime Unit. When I get to the section on forensics, I will also point out that we have written to the state president to make a proclamation to enable the Hawks to continue with this uh, particular um, investigations. But from the investigations that we initiated ourselves, we dismissed and we arrested three employees for fraud after we found evidence, not evidence, we found that they diverted funds that were meant for a student. Three employees resigned after they were found to have lied about their qualifications and two employees uh, were charged and they were fired for tampering with sick notes pertaining to the dates uh, um, uh, on the sick notes. Uh, so those are actions that we have taken internally. There are a number of other investigations and disciplinaries underway against some of the other, some other employees, which I will talk to when I talk about the uh, forensic uh, investigations that we are busy with. With regards to uh, improvements in cybersecurity system of NISFAS. Uh, this is especially important now that NISFAS is operating in a virtual environment. So in 2019, we've had students report that the NISFAS uh, portal had been hijacked and the allowances had been stolen. We have updated this with improved security measures and since this update, we have not received similar um, complaints about that. I might add here also that in a as we tightening up on our cyber security, we also found portals that were open to the outside world and we have shut that down and that manager is, has left the organization. Um, I also just like to add here that we are working with the CSIR and I have uh, Dr. Sibong, uh, Sibong Kiseni in, in the meeting. She can give details about our collaboration uh, with the CSIR to strengthen our overall cyber security. The next slide, implications on the reorganization of the 2019 academic year on the funding of students. We are working very closely with the Department of Higher Education to do financial modeling. And I'm sure that uh, um, the committee would like to get some sense of what the, an additional amount would cost. And so based on just, if we just assume that there's an extension of three months, uh, the, our estimated cost would be just short of 10, million, 10 billion rand or 9.9 .9 billion rand to be exact. Uh, 7.5 billion will be required for universities and 2.5 billion for TVET colleges. I must add that this is a high level calculation and it's meant for illustrative purposes. Um, and also it assumes that NISFAS will continue to pay the tuition and allowance for the extended period. Uh, and this is just for a three month scenario. Uh, we will know more detail when the minister makes their exact announcements about the commencement of the, financial, of the academic year. Uh, and the uh, potential for extension. Uh, we have had a task team meeting today and the minister is having a press conference tomorrow. Uh, NISFA's role in monitoring the institution's disbursement in funding and allowances to students during the COVID-2019 period. So let me just refresh the, mem uh, the uh, committee's memory. So at the moment, uh, NISFA has removed all voucher systems from the from our disbursement chain. And by and large, we have removed all commercial interest, uh, which directed students to specific vendors. But in the university sector, we still pay through the universities and they onward pay to, to students. Um, in the case of TVETs, 
we have mapped the risk of of TVET and we have identified those TVET which will have challenges to pay even before COVID. And initially before COVID uh, lockdown, we identified three colleges to be moved onto the NISFAS wallet where we assume direct payment from us directly to the students. During the period of lockdown, it became apparent that a number of uh, TVET colleges will not be able to do that. And we have now onboarded every month, uh, well, last month we onboarded three more and this month another three. And the total colleges that we are paying directly now are now 38 colleges that we pay directly of the 50, 50 colleges or so. The remaining 12 colleges, uh, our internal uh, risk profile of them and their assurance will continue to pay directly to students. However, having said that, we are in talks with the principal's organization to even take over those 12 colleges um, as a means. As I've indicated, uh, sorry, as direct payment from NISFAS. As I've indicated that earlier, the only solution to de prevent any delays and make sure that students get their money on time is for NISFAS to pay directly into students' bank accounts. We have started that process and we were aiming for to have that process for TVETs in place by June this year. Um, and we have that received uh, authorization from uh, National Treasury to use our own bank. But upon reflection and certainly from the advice from the committee, we decided against that and we opened up a competitive process for other institutions to participate in that. And the reason for that is very simple. That once we reach that stage, we don't want to have any challenges to our to our uh, process. So we intend to have um, all TVET colleges on direct payments from banks from NISFAS to students uh, uh, for the 2021 academic year in place. And then for 2022, we want to onboard all the universities. Uh, we feel very strongly about that because uh, despite our best efforts and despite also the efforts of institutions, Invariably, when you have another party in the disbursement chain, there's bound to be um, uh, challenges or there might be delays. And as we communicate with our institutions, part of the delays that they experience is indeed the fact that students don't in time open their bank accounts. And therefore, we are starting a program of awareness to make students aware that they should be opening up bank accounts. And the choice of the bank accounts will be with the students. So what I'm saying is that we will be paying into students' bank accounts and it will be the bank accounts of their own choices. Now, how do we check whether the monies actually go to the students when we pay it over to institutions? Uh, just to refresh the, the memory of the committee, uh, prior to us receiving the registration data, which we have now received at the end of March, we pay upfront, to, upfront payments to institutions and on that basis, they provide relief to students by paying upfront allowances. Now that we've received the, now that we have received the, the, the registration data for April, we were able to determine the correct amount that should be paid to students based on whether they are on residence on campuses, for instance, or whether they are in private accommodation. And then once we make this payment in April, once we made the payment in April, we were then able to offset the upfront payments and so from now onwards, students should receive the correct amounts uh, going forward. Now, I should also continue to say that there are still challenges, and we have become aware of that, where TV colleges are still struggling to pay onward to, to students. And we are working very closely with them to make sure that the money actually do go out to the students. Um, and in certain cases, like I said, we have actually onboarded those colleges and we will be asking for our money back and we'll be paying the students directly. Um, so that's an ongoing process. But overall, if you, uh, uh, just on the university side, uh, we have not had much uh, problems in the university side of disbursement. We've had challenges with two institutions, which I followed up with the vice chancellors, and they have put in place the necessary steps to make sure not only do they pay the students, but they also provide us with the data of registration. Um, because that's quite important that we receive the correct data um, to do this calculations that I've referred to. If we go to the uh, progress on finalization of outstanding appeals. So first of all, NISFAS deals directly. It's the next slide. Uh, NISFAS deals directly. Yeah, it's the slide, sorry. My apologies. 
This was deals directly with uh, appeals that we receive from new students. Um, and uh, institutions deal with continuing students. In other words, if a student don't meet the qualifications for NISPAS funding because he has been too long in the system, for instance, such a student would make an appeal to the university and based on the recommendations that we receive from the uh, university, we will then reinstate that, um, that student. Now, on the new students, we have received 9,400 appeals for new students. And these most of these appeals would be going around that students would appeal because uh, they uh, are on, on household income. Now, the household income, we receive a declaration from a student when he or she applies. We then do a validation. And if the validation shows that the household actually earns more than what the student had declared, we notify that student and we invite that student to appeal. Now, that system used uh, the credit bureau as data to, to check the household income. Now, certainly at the start of the administration, I found that to be totally unsatisfactory because in most cases, household would, would inflate their income to get better credit status. And so household income determination through the credit bureau is very unsatisfying. I'm very happy to say that we have now finally received the 2019 uh, SARS income data and we are working through it. And we can already see that the difference is quite significant. Uh, in what our outco household income is being declared. So we are taking the entire rejection list or disqualification list and the appeals list, and we're taking that through the SARS data. Um, now, SARS has only provided us with salary income. Uh, and we wrote back to them and said, no, we want total income. And total income means that in some cases, households may receive very low salaries, but may live off very... Uh, high investment income or rental income for that matter. And so we are going to have a much finer comb or a much finer uh, view of, of household income. But just based on our initial base of analysis, which we did over the past week, a number of students uh, could now be moved forward uh, and, and appeals can be finalized because we can already see that the data is indeed correct what they have submitted. What is also very interesting, uh, Chair, is that uh, a large amount of our applicants do not appear on the SARS list. Uh, and what that says to us is that a very large amount of our students, over 100,000 of them, uh, the, their households are operating in the informal market because SARS has got a record of everybody that's working regardless of whether they are taxpayers or not. So we are delving through that data uh, and what it then tells us is that the biggest growth of our funded students, or certainly of our new students, I should say, come from parents that are operating in the informal sector, as well as half of them, uh, half of the total applicants, come from SASA and also. So I'm saying this to show that we are actually do reach the poor and the marginalized in, in the NISFAS um, net. Now, uh, students with uh, continuing students' appeals, um, there is... Uh, you will see that there's a difference between what was recommended by the institution and what was approved by NISFAS. The difference of about 5,000 is due to the fact that in some cases, not in some cases, in all cases, institutions don't have a sector-wide view of students, whereas NISFAS do have that sector-wide view of students. So based on their own institution's uh, records, a student might qualify on the N-plus rule. But when we check, we check the sector, and then we find that students have been to other universities before, and therefore they exceed the N plus rule based on that. I have made an appeal, and I've written to the Department of Higher Education to make this EMAS data, which is the sector-wide data, available to all institutions so that we don't have to end up in a situation where students initially think they are successful, only to be found later on that they are based on our data that they are not, not qualifying. Um, the, the continuing students from TVET colleges is on the low side, and we are working with the principals to improve that. Uh, so we have not received all the appeals statistics from TVET colleges um, as we speak. Um, certainly from our production perspective, we are on top of all the information that we've received, and all the outstanding issues are 
uh, issues that we are in contact with with the different institutions. And, and number seven, the next slide. Um, um, uh, one of the members raised an issue that uh, the APP was outsourced to a private individual at a cost of one million rand. That is that is not true. Yeah, the, our APP was not outsourced. I took personal control of the APP and the strategic plan. And the reason why I took personal control of that is because of the number of times that we were embarrassed at par in Parliament because of poor quality uh, submissions. And also the fact that we in many cases, well, in one case, at least in the NCOP's case, we submitted that late. Uh, that was a situation that I took full responsibility for and a situation that I take responsibility for to correct as well. So the appointment of this individual was done following all the prescripts in the, of the PFME and the PPF. Um, and I'm satisfied that we have done everything that we had to do to make sure that we uh, onboard this individual at the, at the correct uh, processes. Uh, and the value of the procurement award was 490,000. Um, this individual... Is it 57? Is it allocation? This individual was uh, a, a, a pr um, employed for a period of four months. And part of his work will be to train our staff to do this performance plans and strategic plans properly. Um, number eight, whether NISFAS is involved in the procurement to students and where will the budget come from? NISFAS is not involved in the procurement. The minister has sent out a note to, to state that it will be centralized. What NISFAS proposal did was to say to the minister that we have always maintained that the book allowance of 5,000 Rand, which is 5,200 Rand this year, per year for a student is sufficient to equip that student with the necessary uh, apparatus or devices to, uh, to, um, to participate meaningfully in education. Uh, now, this allowance that I'm referring to was termed a book allowance in the past, and it is certainly not a book allowance. It's a teaching aid allowance. I think over the years, the book allowance got a life of its own. Um, and so our proposal to the minister was saying that going forward, we should be applying this 5,200 rand, which amounts to about 20,000 rand for a student if he or she is in the system for four years, be used to enable digital enablement and make sure that students have the ability to use the fourth industrial revolution technology to add to their pedagogy. The question now is what do you do with this year? Because in this year's case, some institutions have already paid that out, whilst other institutions actually did it, uh, did provide the students with digital devices. An occasion point would be Sol Plyke, which and, and UNISA, which used this money to, to procure digital devices. So we have made a proposal that we could probably cash, that we can cash flow manage that even for this year's student, uh, certainly in the university environment. The, the additional uh, caveat to this is that in the past, TVET students were not provided with this allowance. And in our submission to the minister, we also put forward that we should be catering for TVET students as well. Um, the minister made that announcement that NISFA students will be furnished with uh, the digital devices. Um, and so in the task team that the ministers put together, the procurement and the availability is being worked out. So the answer basically is NISFAS is not involved in the procurement of laptops, um, but the NISFAS budget, a part of the budget will be used to procure. Uh, we are waiting direction for the minister and the task team on that. And I, and I think the minister will make an announcement when he, used, when he, when he addressed the press tomorrow morning. Reason for, for, for targeting an unqualified audit opinion for 2020, um, the initial entry into uh, our APP said that we are targeting a qualified audit opinion. Now, Chair, I cannot submit to uh, this committee that we are going to go for a mediocre performance. And therefore, we, in our resubmission, with your permission, we want to change that to an unqualified audit. We want to aim for an quali unqualified audit for this year. And we believe we've done sufficient work to, to, be, to be optimistic about that. Um, can the I impact of the COVID? Can I interrupt you a little bit? Uh, Prof, 
I see you have got 24 slides. Sure, okay. And we are now at number at number 13. Okay. And I thought that uh, we will allocate only 30 minutes per each entity. So can we give you until 20 to 7? Just to finalize, okay. if you missed out anything, I think members have got copies. Okay, thanks. Um, so I'll skip over the uh, impact of the recovery. It has um, it has been uh, negatively affected. The numbers are all there. Allegations that CPUT students are no longer receiving their allowances. This speaks to that N plus rule, which I referred to earlier, where once we check the EMAS data, we find that the students have been in the system for a much longer time. Uh, possibilities of giving payment holidays to students. Um, we we seek direct. We sought direction from the Department of Education, and we are waiting their guidance on the on the possibility of an extended holiday. Inconsistencies in the targets provided in the APP. I did say last time in my opening remarks that I'm very unhappy with the quality of our APP and also our reporting, uh, and therefore we will ask the committee to resubmit and we have indicated where those inconsistencies are on, on that particular slide. Um, I have spoken to the fact that NISFAS has used the COVID-19 to engage institutions. Um, I should also say that um, we have managed to clear a significant backlog, um, 42,000 or more of students that had outstanding documents. We've brought that down to 12,000, so we were very, very, very effective in that particular area during the lockdown. Historic debt summary, uh, it's there for the members to see, and that's the current status quo. We have re-engaged THET, and a new set of rules will be issued uh, to institutions to see how we can improve on the situation uh, and make sure that uh, more students can benefit from this particular initiative from government. Um, whether there's plans to assist the missing middle policies, uh, missing middle students, we are engaging the minister on that particular issue. And then the, I think the important issue is the issue on the progress of the NISFAS forensic investigations. Uh, we have listed all of the uh, forensic investigations that are underway. We have spent 8.5 million rand on in, uh, forensic investigations from a 10 million rand that was allocated to us by the minister. Um, equalization of stipends, that's a policy issue which DHET must speak to and we... Uh, we are engaging them on that. Uh, and then we have listed a number of uh, issues that we are putting in place post the administration period. So we are going through a process of appointing the senior executives. We have initiated a projects to look at documenting all our processes and mapping and uh, developing standard operating procedures. Uh, and we call that the ISO project. Um, the ISO standard will be applicable. Our governance is significantly improved and we are, of course, keeping the AG in, in, in uh, regular meetings uh, on top of that. And the risk management pr processes have also been uh, um, instituted. Uh, so I, I'll stop there, Chair. And like you said, the members have the benefit of reading the document, and we will leave them sufficient time for engagement. Thank you very much. Intention, sorry, the intention was not to stop you now was for you to summarize the rest of the slides. Uh, because we're still left with about three minutes. Okay, then uh, uh, in summary, um, so the question of uh, post-administration, so the second term of administration comes to an end, uh, the end of August this year. Uh, we are preparing a handover document uh, for the minister, uh, uh, explaining in detail all the issues that need still attention going forward, uh, what we've put in place and what the plans are. I'm having discussions with the minister, detailed discussions around uh, the post-administration period that comes to an end in 2021. I would not want to preempt that discussion, but the minister uh, and myself are engaging on that particular issue. Uh, the minister, I believe, if you recall, that part of my um, terms of reference was to put together a... Um, ministerial committee that will look at the future of NISFAS, um, whether, and that will include certainly the new systems that I've referred to, uh, the new operating model, which may or may not include 
the outreach into into uh, 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 branch offices, uh, the whole host of things as to how the future NISFAS can become more relevant and more effective. I believe he has signed off on that, and he will probably also make an announcement in that regard um, about the ministerial committee uh, and, and their workings. But uh, the ministerial committee will be reporting to the minister, um, um, and it will not be meant to replace the management of, of, of NISFAS. So um, just to come back, uh, there was a question that I think is somewhere hidden in here that, that I just recall now, the issue of uh, whether NISFAS expend excessively on, um, on, on, on legal cost. The answer is no, we are within budget. Uh, I think the confusion may, come, may have come around because of the money that we spend on forensic uh, investigations. Uh, the forensic reports are all, of, are all available and the minister has been briefed on it. Uh, and like I said, we continuously brief also the Auditor General on some of these forensic reports. I should also add that some of these forensic reports have led and will continue to lead to further disciplinary actions as the forensic reports actually do make recommendations for us to institute disciplinary uh, actions against some individuals. And in other cases, it also recommends that we institute criminal uh, uh, investigations against certain individuals. Um, so, so that those reports are, are most of them are completed, and the minister has been fully briefed on on on, on the outcomes of those forensics. But I think, chair, um, um, I think I've used up my three minutes, but uh, yeah. I'm very happy to yeah. engage. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Prof. You. Yeah, um, in three minutes. It's now 22 to 7. Uh, we are going to take uh, what is the next one? It's Commission on Higher Education. Uh, we'll ask the chairperson of the board, uh, I believe is Professor Musia, to then uh, talk to us. <clears throat> the responses have already been sent to the members, so if there is anything, we will uh, allow just a few minutes for follow-up questions, but mainly this was intended for the responses in the main, so that's why we're giving more time to the entities. Uh, Prof, are you? I'm ready. Okay, over to you. Uh, thank you very much, uh, uh, Honorable Chair and Honorable Members, including all other colleagues here tonight. Um, the, our presentation, as the Chair says, has been sent, and uh, we would like to, to share um, some of the responses we have there. Just projected it, I'm sure we were able to see that. Um, Chair, the first question um, was on the implications of uh, the budget cut uh, that uh, Honorable Bozoli posed. And, and we say, well, we, we saw what uh, SACO presented, but we can't comment much about their side. But on our side, we know that uh, the ministerial statement had actually uh, declared that uh, we'll get uh, a 25 million baseline injection which we are still hoping to, to, to get as soon as it is possible. And the, the, the budget that we have presented, as it is required by policy, is the approved budget. And, and the implications obviously are if for some reason there is a cut or top slicing, we'll have to, to see how we reprioritize uh, the budget and, and see what happens to the APP targets that we have set. Um, and the second question about our role um, in advising the Minister on the establishment of uh, the University in Ekuruleni, uh, well, of course, uh, as it has been said, and we all know this, the President de declared this in Parliament, and we believe the Department is still busy uh, getting ready uh, with the work there. But in terms of the Act, as it is required, the Minister will seek advice uh, from the CHE uh, particularly on the offerings that uh, that uh, the, the department and or the province would have uh, agreed to and will do the necessary quality assurance uh, as a statutory body responsible for it. So 
we we will await that uh, process to unfold. I guess uh, these recent developments are probably disturbing a few other things. On the third question, Chair, on the concerns uh, around the shift from contact learning to multimodal uh, learning, well, of course, uh, we, we we know as the CHE and, and many other stakeholders that uh, we we have been, you know, in a way engaged with some form of uh, uh, e-learning uh, over time, albeit not at the same level, but uh, particularly in response to this concern. Um, our Higher Education Quality Committee uh, looked at this and, and communicated with uh, professional bodies and other regulation uh, regulatory agencies. And we we are operating, of course, within the ambit of the ministerial task team now because it is not advisable to speak at cross purposes. And um, and all of that work that, that relate to the concerns is being addressed at that level that we make the inputs. And, um, and the minister of, obviously also advised on not sending mixed messages across the sector. And that is what we are doing. And um, and of course, Chair, if we look at the work that we do with USAF and the department, I'm sure some of you would have seen today the presentation that was made uh, to team in relation to all of these things. Uh, we, we do what is necessary to ensure that the quality of provision uh, is preserved, even if it is uh, in a multimodal uh, learning environment. And other than that, we we are continuing with our normal work in terms of uh, standards and reviews, in terms of uh, planning for quality audits. Uh, most, of course, we can't do them now because uh, the these require side visits and we, we are not uh, able to, to visit institutions and do things and have meetings and so forth. But uh, that that work will be will be delayed uh, uh, until we we are at the appropriate level that uh, that the NCC will advise us uh, to continue the work. And and institutions are engaged in online approach teaching and so forth. But we know that uh, we are not at the same level. Uh, there are other institutions who are still uh, having glitches in terms of of, uh, of that and um, we we are looking into that as a team uh, and to continuing on the on this question on I mean those students who are completing you know studies in their professions you know medicine engineering all of their professions and the worry that uh, they will suffer as a result of uh, of what is happening, you know, for training, whether it's uh, work integrated learning or internships and so on and so forth, we we, we are engaging with uh, these organisations so that the students are not uh, prejudiced in any way whatsoever. Um, and it it also relates to the question that was posed by one of the honourable members about the the quality of online learning outcomes. The guiding principle here is that uh, no student should be left behind. Um, the, the, the department declared that, we declared that as a sector, and we know we are encountering glitches uh, with online learning because some students are in areas where they can't be able to, to have connectivity and so on and so forth. And, and our approach is that uh, they will not be disadvantaged by that. And institutions will, you know, different variations be able to to, to enable students to, to catch up with the work. And these are internal arrangements that they're supposed to be doing. And the ministerial task team is seized with this. Uh, and of course, institutions have been cooperating so far to, to give us uh, information that, that can assist uh, with these kinds of interventions. And but institutions should should be able to do this because, you know, with quality assurance, we know that uh, 
the primary responsibility is supposed to be with the institutions. We quality assure those mechanisms and ensure that uh, the outcomes are above board. And, um, and I've spoken about the interventions of institutions and that we guarantee the quality. And we, we also um, think that um, ad hoc interventions and the conditions of a crisis will just create a problem. So we, we are actually working with institutions through USAF, with the department and ourselves. So because this is something that is new and particularly for those institutions that uh, that are not as ready as others because of uh, the disparities we have in the system. And, and we hold the view that uh, whatever changes that are made in terms of uh, the mode of delivery uh, and shifts in terms of assessments and, and so forth should not compromise quality. Um, and we, we have the mechanisms to check that as a quality assurance board. On the fourth question, Chair, on the delays um, of accreditation, this is quite an extensive answer. I will not go through everything here. Safe to say that uh, uh, part of the delays had to do with the quality of the submissions and also outstanding information. And, and the matter of the South African Nursing Council is a very big problem that, that we have um, in, in the higher education sector. We have engaged the Minister of Health, we have engaged our minister, you know, I mean, since last year sometime, that there are serious glitches there uh, with, the, with the nursing council in terms of uh, and accreditation, which must come to us, to the overarching body, to ensure that things happen. Even as we're entering this COVID phase, we engaged with uh, the minister uh, as well as the Minister of Health, that the nursing profession is in a crisis. And the training of uh, these professionals is delayed by one of the professional bodies for whatever reason that the Minister of Health and them should, should fix. And, and also with the program qualification mixed, approval was outstanding. So there were a number of uh, glitches with respect to the the programs there and, and of course in the education program uh, we have provided details um, for Walter Sully University um, and, and dates of what has happened so I will not repeat all of these in the interest of time because I'm sure you still want to engage with us um, so the protracted accreditation process cannot be attributed to the delay uh, but it is on our part, of course, not that uh, we, we we do not delay things because of uh, the dates of meetings, but we've accelerated some of the of the applications to assist the institution, but the quality of submissions are a big problem. And, and the tables on this um, slide and the next one give further details on the program, on the dates that were submitted and and the outcomes and so on and so forth. Uh, I will not go through all of that. And, and the fifth question about the research on ICT capabilities, this work was done by USAF and the department, and we did not want to duplicate the work because we are all working and as a comprehensive 140 uh, page document by the department together, uh, some of which is forming part of the presentation that are being made in testing. So, uh, lecturers and, and reskilling. We know that teachers, well, should continue to to improve their skills and learn as, as the environment goes. Um, we we have, in any case, uh, through the online learning environment, uh, across in varying degrees, of course, of preparedness, there are capacities within institutions. Uh, some are able to do it because they have much more capacity or resources and others are lagging behind because of infrastructure related uh, matters. So there are all of these hurdles that relate to issues of affordability and, and data and so on and so forth. But uh, the physical location of students, uh, where there is no connectivity, remains a big concern. 
and a number of institutions are, are putting interventions to see how they can reach the students. Of course, this will also depend on uh, the levels of uh, lockdown um, as, as approved, and we can begin to have more and more students on campuses uh, under the strict regulations that we have. Um, UNISA, as we, I said in my open remarks then, and the CEO also mentioned it, we, we had uh, planned to, to start this audit with uh, UNISA. We are now constrained by what is happening, but the planning uh, that we can do in terms of putting panels together and structuring the thing that's going on. And once we are able to do that, we'll, we'll do it because uh, we, we believe and we have had many discussions that uh, this university, which takes, I mean, a third really of the student population in the country, needs to be uh, assisted um, as far as possible in terms of quality. Uh, Chair, the, the submission of uh, of this uh, accreditation or registration framework, the, what the CEO was saying here is that we are developing, in fact, this document, our National Quality Assurance Framework, we, we have now revised the regime, how we want to, to do things, and we'll share this uh, with uh, the committee as soon as it has gotten some other uh, iterations with the sector. Yeah. You know, our normal reporting lines will engage with you and as part of the APP, but also when the document is ready to send. And the reorganization of the academic year chair remains uh, a serious challenge, but uh, with the faced, you know, opening of campuses and, and categories of students that will go, uh, institutions will be able to, to advise the, the committee, the ministerial task team. But we, we are hoping that uh, a staggered approach may be possible. We, we, we haven't uh, really refined this, but uh, we, all efforts are put in place to, to see how we can save that kind of care. That's the primary. Uh, but remember, the main issue here is about health, really. Uh, of, our, of our people, and then the rest follows in terms of what you can save and open the economy and all of the other things that we are being advised on by the government. Um, and so we, we will see uh, the, the institutions are reworking their calendars under the context that, that we have described uh, with uh, the DHT, of course, uh, and, and us, and, and use of uh, providing advice as, as appropriate. And I'm sure that uh, the presentation that was made for those members who are here in the Minister Task Team would see that this, this uh, work was covered there. Uh, the last question, Chair, which um, Anurum Kachwa posed about CETs and TVETs, uh, just in a nutshell, really, we this falls under a different quality council, but there has been many such questions that came from the portfolio committee uh, in the past. And when we had our meeting with the minister, Minister Pando then, because we really had streamlined our things to see how best we can be able to cooperate, um, we were advised to focus on, on universities and other QCs to do what they're supposed to be doing. However, because we have uh, the CEO committee uh, convened by SAPWA, but we also have all of these interventions with all the QCs, it is that kind of uh, work that happens there. Uh, one of the meetings is chaired by the director general, where all the uh, stakeholders, us, the QCs and SAPWA sit and map their way forward in terms of uh, articulation and all of those other interventions that are being referred to here. Uh, Chair, I'll stop there. I think I've saved you enough time. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. You did save me a lot of time. Uh, uh, we, we are back in time now. Uh, back on our own schedule. I think we will take uh, the next 30 minutes 
for SACWA to then give us their responses. <clears throat> I don't know who will be taking us through, whether it's the chair or the CEO. Thank you, Chair. Um, it's uh, Julie Reddy, the CEO of SACWA. The chair is there too, and she will answer some questions, but I will take you to the slides. Okay. Uh, can Anela put them up, or should my my person do that? Uh, Anela, are you able to uh, share with us the uh, presentation? I can get my person, Chair. Would that be easier? Okay. She's ready. Yeah, no, okay, Nareen, if you can put up the slides. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Chair and Honourable Members of the both committees. Um, okay, the first question that TACWA, uh, that was raised with TACWA, uh, dealt with SACWA's uh, plan to amend its budget. So, um, I just want to um, yes. advise... Sorry? Uh, is the noise coming from your side? No, I'm sitting very quietly in my room. <laughs> there is somebody <laughs> who has not muted uh, his or a mic. Uh, please, members and participants, let's just uh, switch our mics off. The yeah, person, the person wants to dance. Okay, so who's speaking now? Oh, no, it's Honorable Lita. I was saying that person is dancing, Chairperson. Uh, can they participate in the meeting? <laughs> <laughs> okay, sure. Let them switch off their mic uh, if they want to dance. <clears throat> okay, uh, Julie can proceed. Uh, at TCO, you can continue. Uh, Julie. Sorry, I, yeah. Sorry, Chair. I tried to mute my video and I muted my microphone. Okay. So, SACWA's plan to amend its budget, that was the first, uh, related to the first question we received. So, SACWA, I just want to alert the committee that the uh, SACWA also received an instruction from DHEAD to to look into cutting its budget by 20%. And this is an instruction that came from National Treasury to all public entities. Um, I just want to, uh, you know, brief the members about what the situation is with SACWA and what our considerations are in our response. Uh, SACWA's budget is uh, just over 160 million for the 2020-21 financial year. Of this 44%, is from the government grant. You will see the numbers on the on the slides. And 56% is the income that we had hoped to generate from our services. And these were based on patterns from previous years and, uh, uh, you know, on other kind of dependencies like the NQF Amendment Act becoming effective uh, in April. So... You can see there from our own uh, generated income, we projected 48 million from our foreign qualification evaluation services and 37 million from the verification of national qualifications. And then there are smaller amounts of sundry income, interest earned and other income, uh, and uh, about 3 million that we earn from uh, professional the fees we charge for professional body recognition and the services we provide to them. And sorry, the last one is the uh, the two million for the interest. The sundry income, sorry, chair, is the other monies that we make in terms of uh, charging for other services. Next one, Maureen. So, chair, our big problem is since the lockdown, uh, our evaluation of foreign qualification service has been greatly affected. Um, you know. With the 
with the decline of any, uh, you know, people coming into the, well, with the stoppage of any people coming into the country, and also people in the country unable to meet our application requirements, the demand for the service has been reduced drastically. And actually, we haven't received any application since the lockdown started. We are trying to, uh, you know, revive this and working with some external uh, providers like Postnet and others. And we hope to get this up and running, but we don't think that the scale that we estimated will ever get back until possibly next year. Um, we also, you know, are unable to issue the certificate of evaluation because this is dependent on us verifying qualifications with foreign institutions. And with the lockdown, uh, you know, most of these institutions are not available um, and, um, you know, contactable. And also, uh, so this has delayed our ability or restricted our ability to provide the service. Next slide, Nareen. Um, our verification of our national qualifications has also been affected. Um, you know, mostly employers use the service when they are employing new people, mostly in the public service, but some in the private sector. And the demand is greatly reduced because of people putting moratoriums on filling vacancies during this period. And also we haven't had much demand from the national and provincial departments. And it's also been, you know, this been impacted by restrictions placed on uh, traveling because SACWA has also newly taken on the responsibility of issuing verification letters to South Africans with national qualifications who want to work overseas. So. The, the pandemic has really affected these two functions quite drastically. Next slide, Marie. Um, so this uh, sundry income is the income we receive from projects uh, that you know we manage from time to time. These are both local projects and international projects. Um, we also anticipated some income from conferences that we have had to postpone. Next one. Uh, our professional body's income has declined because their members are unable to pay their fees and their income has declined and this has also affected their ability uh, and their financials. So, you know, it has a spin-off effect on our income. Next one. Okay. And also one of our big concerns is um, the interest that we earn and that our projection is based on the balance of what is invested. And usually this is a quite a significant amount of money, but we are now in a situation where we are withdrawing our invested funds to cover salaries and other expenses. So there is not mon uh, much money because we're not generating the income, so the interest has declined. All right, based on all of this chair and based on our salary uh, bill, uh, which is not covered fully by the government grant, as I explained earlier, and we've already cut our operational costs to a bare minimum and we've incurred savings. We've had a, um, a freeze on filling vacant salaries. And even with all those measures we've put into place, we believe as SACWA that a further cut in the government grant will be untenable for SACWA to continue to deliver services for 2020 and 2021. Next one. So the next question uh, I think came from Prof. Bozzoli about the uh, ADIS convention and recognition of qualifications, in, uh, you know, relating to recognition of qualifications and higher education in African states. So we have attached that document for members. Uh, just to give you a brief um, summary of it, so far 13 African countries, including South Africa, have ratified the and deposited their instruments of ratification. Uh, the Addis Convention required 10 to become effective. It uh, came into force in December 2019. And I think the question was asked, what is it about? It deals with higher education, learner mobility on the African continent. And of course, SACWA has a big role to play with it with our foreign qualification evaluation services and comparing across countries. Um, 
there is an undertaking uh, in terms of this convention to develop an African continental qualifications framework. Um, this work has commenced uh, a mapping exercise by the Joint Education Trust uh, is underway on qualifications across all African countries and SACWA is involved as an expert advisor on this initiative. Another key uh, part of the ADIS Convention is uh, a requirement to provide uh, to recognize qualifications of refugees and asylum seekers living in various African countries through the use of RPL and other uh, mechanisms where um, these uh, cohort of people cannot produce documentation that can be used to verify their qualifications. Um, SACWA is very involved with the African Qualification Verification Network. Uh, it's a network that we uh, initiated a few years ago, and uh, this enables us to verify qualifications in Africa and, and really has gone a long way to reduce misrepresented and fraudulent qualifications uh, in, in people coming into the country. Um, and SACWA is working on its own plan to implement aspects of the ADIS Convention as is delegated to us by the Department of Higher Education and Training. Next one. So the next one relates to the reasons for the increase in the budget for outsourced services. Um, Chair, it's not really outsourced services, but our expenses to develop our IT systems have uh, you know, increased drastically. So you will see that our budget increase that's reflected in our 2020-21 budget is not from voted funds from the fiscus, but on the projected income that we generate. And, and a large um, increase projected is through SACWA's verification function. And this SACWA assumed a greater demand for this function after the, uh, you know, the, the president uh, published the Amendment Act and uh, we, we expected the proclamation in April but that, of course, has been delayed with the, you know, with the pandemic. Um, we find that for SACWA to compete with other verification agencies, and these are in the private sector, we really need to invest in better systems and automated systems while we keep our fees uh, and charges competitive. So that's, you know, quite a difficult thing to juggle. So our expenditure there is also high. And we have been affected by some of the lockdown implications. Um, and so we are looking for an adjustment uh, to make an adjustment to our income and expenditure budgets. It's just absolutely necessary now that you know we've gone to these last few months uh, in the in the lockdown uh, period and you know the extension of the lockdown and the impact it's having on our income generating services. Next one, Marie. So the next question was whether SACWA has the infrastructure to maintain the registers of fraudulent and misrepresented qualifications or part qualifications and professional designations. I just want to assure members, Chair, that the registers for these professional designation, designations, misrepresented qualifications and fraudulent qualifications, as per the amendment to the Act, already exist but they exist as separate documents that are not linked to the uh, National Learner Records Database. So we have been reporting to the minister uh, if, uh, on a bi-monthly basis on misrepresentation. Uh, what we are doing now is formalizing it with the data register uh, on the NLRD. Um, so SACWA has the IT infrastructure, I just want to confirm that, to develop and maintain these registers. And uh, we have already developed the register for professional des designations, and it is being implemented because when we realized that we couldn't register professional designations on the NQF and that we have to register them against a qualification on the NQF, uh, we developed this register and have been implementing for the past few years. So the registers for foreign, uh, fraudulent and mis 
two registers, one for fraudulent and misrepresented qualifications and part qualifications are currently, uh, you know, being developed. They're in the final stages, being refined, I would say, and they would be ready for implementation when the president uh, proclaims the amendments to the NQF Act. Thank you. Noreen, yeah. Chair, the next question deals with what is being done regarding the articulation of TVET qualifications with higher education qualifications. The CHE has already responded to that in the previous uh, presentation. I just want to add, and I think members might be interested, that SACWA has worked very extensively on a three-year partnership with the Durban University of Technology and we have dealt with articulation initiatives between TVET and uh, UOT qualifications in a number of institutions nationally. Uh, and we've got uh, very good case studies of um, very mature articulation uh, practices and some which are emerging and some which have been started but are still latent in the system. So this research has clearly documented some very good practices. Uh, we have circulated the report to members on the committee. We, we added it as an attachment to our presentation. The next phase, we hope to support some models and implementing institutions to take these initiatives to scale. And we will report on that accordingly. Uh, as I've said, the research report, which has some very interesting information of of practice on the ground, we have circulated to members. Um, the next question related to the impact of the cabinet decision to free senior management salaries uh, on, and on attracting and retaining suitably qualified staff at senior management levels of the entity. We please to report chair that the freeze on manager salary for the last financial year did not affect uh, staff retention and service delivery, but it may in the future. It's very hard to, you know, use a crystal ball on this. Thank you. Next one. Uh, Chair, the outcome of the verification of the qualification of this person, the acting DVC of operations at TUT, I did write a, a, a detailed response to the chair, which I hope uh, you have shared uh, with the members, but I just want to raise what we uh, put in our response. Uh, firstly, I want to apologize to, to you, Chair, and the members that um, this just came to my attention when you reminded me uh, a, couple of, uh, a couple of weeks ago. And I apologize for this oversight. Uh, during my transition from being DCO to acting CEO, I probably missed this, but I want to assure the Portfolio Committee that this oversight was a once-off occurrence uh, and assure you also that SACWA has systems in place to address all queries, time, uh, all queries timeously. We did send you a full response on the 14th of May, Chair, as I indicated. Uh, I just want to raise for members and just clarify that SACWA has two separate units one dealing with the verification of national qualification, and the second deals with the evaluation of foreign qualification. Now, this particular individual had both types of qualifications. In the sense of the um, verification of national qualifications, uh, you asked about turnaround timelines, and it was a concern of the committee. If the information is on the NLRD, it can take... 24 hours to two days for us to turn around uh, the verification. But it could take up to 20 days, Chair, if SACWA must con contact individual institutions to verify each record. So we are very dependent on external informational partners. Um, and after 20 days, if we do not get any response, despite all our efforts to look for the manual records, speak to information partners, uh, try to look in the archives and DBE, uh, then we will send a response saying that the outcome was inconclusive and we close the, uh, the records. Otherwise, we, we face audit issues for leaving the, the files open. 
So usually, SACWA requests, uh, receives requests from employers wanting to verify the national records of potential or current employees, and we don't actually receive requests from individuals. Now, our Foreign Qualification Evaluation Service, which is a separate function, works very differently in that it requires the qualification holder to apply to SACWA for the evaluation of the qualification. And this is in line with protection of information and other legislative requirements. Uh, and these are used for the purposes of getting visas or to further their studies or, or to enter into the job market in South Africa. Uh, there are also South Africans with foreign qualifications who apply to have the, their qualifications verified. And this service takes between one and three months, depending on the length of time it takes to verify the authenticity of the qualification of awards, which is done with international information partners. And this involves verifying whether the qualification is registered and is accredited in the country of origin whether the qualification holder has actually achieved that qualification. Uh, and so, you know, we do quite an intensive check uh, and whether the qualification actually was registered when the qualification holder had enrolled for that qualification. So, you know, the, the checks we do are quite complicated. Next slide, Maureen. So, Chair, just in terms of this, um, uh, you know, continuing with this discussion, uh, SACWA currently stores information about awarding foreign qualification evaluation certificates on its own database. And this is separate from the database containing national qualifications achievements. But we have, you know, looked at uh, the Portfolio Committee's original requests and um, you know, we noted that our verifications team, because these two functions are separate, they did not have access to the foreign qualifications database. And this also contributed to the delays. Uh, and, you know, SACWA, you know, takes this issue very seriously. And it is our wish to combine both databases when funding become available. So we're not faced in the situation where one candidate has national qualifications and foreign qualifications, and we have to search for the information in different databases and different units dealing with the queries. So SACWA was able to confirm that this individual in question from TUT was in possession of two foreign qualifications and one national qualifications. However, the in, uh, what was also sent in the requests were professional designations and the professional designations were both uh, uh, to professional bodies in South Africa and uh, outside of the country. And we were not able to confirm this individual's professional designations because one, the, this is the mandate of the professional bodies because it issues license of practice. It's not actually linked to the qualification achievement. So it falls outside of our mandate. Um, okay, uh, about the digitization chair, to date we have implemented various projects using both donor and our own funds. We had, uh, years ago, we also reported on this to the portfolio committee, we had the Tirello Bosch uh, project that was funded by the Flemish government with the Department of Public Service and Administration, and this project resulted in over 800,000 learner achievement records being scanned and indexed, which means that it is on the NLRD, it was digitized, and it comprised 541,000 pre-1992 senior certificate records, and it also included two, over 259,000 teacher records. More recently, Chair, we used our own funds to scan Western Cape teacher records that were in our possession, and we didn't want to return it. Uh, because we thought, you know, we, we won't see these records again uh, if it goes back to the provinces and might take a long time for us to get it back. And this gave us an additional 42,000 pages of senior certificate records and 53,000 pages of teacher records, which we have scanned 
They are not indexed yet, but we can use this information to verify quali national qualifications. The whole digitization is a cost intensive exercise, Chair, and without the allocation of funds for this work, there is very little SACWA can do. Uh, Chair, I also want to raise that in terms of the Act, it's the QC's responsibilities, the three QC's, to load achievement data on the NLRD. And SACWA is in the process of finalizing a regulation dealing with data loading responsibilities and filling the gaps on the NLRD. Once this is finalized, we will proactively advise the minister to issue the regulations and we hope that this will also prioritize the digitization and address uh, some of the data gaps issues. Uh, Chair, in addition, I just want to mention that the QCTO can speak more about them. The QCTO was awarded an NSF grant and is busy with digitization of occupational and trade records. Um, the progress with the appointment of contractual staff in the verifications project on a permanent basis Chair, verification staffs were appointed on fixed term contracts because SACWA was not mandated to perform this function in terms of the Act. We were performing it on a project basis since 2010 uh, in response to a directive from the Minister of Public Service and Administration. And, uh, and this was challenged by state entities and in particular by the Western Cape government where they said SACWA is not legally mandated to do this job. Uh, the matter has now been addressed in the Amendment Act and once proclaimed, we will address this issue and we will proceed with employing uh, permanent staff and uh, making the verifications project into a directorate and, uh, you know, bringing that into the SACWA staffing structure. Uh, okay, Chair, I think this might be the last question. I'm not sure. Does SACWA provide advice to the executive authority when there is a request on a proactive or on a request basis? We do both, Chair, uh, after we carefully consider the matters requiring attention. Thank you very much, Chair. I hope that explain, uh, you know, provided uh, the responses you require, but we're glad to take extra questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Reddy, um, and all uh, Professor Musia and uh, Dr. Carolison. Thank you all of you for the for the responses. I think uh, they've been very comprehensive, and uh, I must say that. From where I'm seated, I'm quite satisfied. I'm happy with the with the comprehensiveness of uh, the responses. Unlike if we had insisted that you take about five minutes, you were not going to get this kind of information. Uh, but otherwise, <clears throat> we've made provision for members to uh, do follow-ups if there are any. We are not going to take long. I think we will limit for about two follow-ups. Uh, so that we utilize 15 minutes for follow-ups, 15 minutes for the responses, and then we will be done. So it's not a new meeting. It's a continuation of the APP, the strike plans, and the budget. Okay, uh, can I <clears throat> uh, get an indication from the members uh, if they want to Uh, okay, I'm not sure whether there is a there is an icon there of where you can raise your hand. Uh, so we can use the combination of the charts and the the icon on raising the hand. I've got Honorable Mananiso, uh, Honorable Kiezi. Uh, Honorable Boshoff, uh, Honorable Mukacho, um, okay, let's go to the 
messages in the chats. Okay, so I only have four hands that I've noted. Uh, Chairperson, this screen has got five different things here. It's as if somebody is controlling my screen. I've pressed that thing a long time ago. Okay. Uh, sorry, Chair. Uh, I don't know if you can hear me. Honorable not that I uh, Chair. I've also sent a message through a long time ago. Okay. <clears throat> yeah, I think um, there's a bit of a problem with the screen now. Honorable uh, Chair? Yes. Honorable Mkhatra, I think um, the, someone might be sharing their screen. Yeah. I think that can be attempt. If whoever, I, I'm, I'm just assuming that that, that, that yeah, could be the, the current person. Yeah, I want to attend that one. Uh, whoever was sharing the screen with us from, okay, it's fine now. All right, I think we, we're all fine now. Uh, let me see where the messages. Uh, so I've got, uh, I've got Honorable Mananiso. I've got Honorable Kietze, Honorable Boshoff, Honorable Mukachwa, Litsie, and Notada. In that order. <clears throat> Let's just bear in mind, members, that this is a follow-up meeting. The follow-up question must just be strictly related to the responses that we received today. No new question. Uh, can we start with you, Honorable Mananis? Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Uh, let me welcome all the presentations. Chairperson, my question is on the issue of 490,000. I would like uh, the administrator to perhaps submit the terms of reference because for me, I feel that this uh, 490,000, it's, it's like looting for me. So I, I, I just need the terms of reference to be forwarded. And again, uh, I like the fact that the administrator has indicated the issues of inconsistency in terms of their APP. As much as they have appointed the service provider, I think they are uh, APPs as well. They are still inconsistent. So I I'm worried about the issue of uh, this particular person being fit for purpose. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, the 490 is the amount, 490,000, the amount paid for the service provider to compile the APPs, I suppose. Eh? Okay, um, can we get Honorable Gates? Excuse me, Chair. Chair. Uh, who's speaking? It's Honorable Ngobo, Chair. Will you please add me on the list? I've been trying uh, whilst there was this problem. Okay. Yes, thank you, Chair. I will add you, uh, Honorable Mwabu. Thank you. Get, get, Honorable Kietze. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. Very quick. I mean, with starting with NS first, well, I was just looking at the consequence management. I mean, the, the steps they have taken. They are saying there are three employees that were arrested, two have resigned, and two tempered with signals. And when you look at Really, if you look deep into this uh, eight million that they have spoken about, I mean, the level of their crimes does not amount to the, you know, the weight or the magnitude of what the AG has found with regard to the finances of NSFAS. I mean, saying that tampering with signal and comparing with billions that have been lost, I think uh, somewhere, somehow, there's a foul play that needs to be clarified. And there's an appeal process of NSFAS students. I'm very perplexed perhaps to mention this because from time to time we complain that uh, uh, NSFAS is not taking enough students who qualify uh, to, to get this funding to further their studies. But when you look at their appeals and the reasons they give thereof of students who were rejected, none of the reasons given says in sufficient funding. 
it means NSFAS is well financially resourced. They do not have any crisis. The only problems they have is the income threshold, your 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 costs that are not found, funded. And if that is the case, he must confirm because we have a different view. We have so many students who qualify, who have submitted so many times relevant documents that are not entertained to date. Uh, I just wanted to raise that maybe with the, the Council of Higher Education, uh, with regard to the, the I, I mean, when we were speaking the, the previous weeks with regard to the online uh, process of learning and teaching, maybe you should go and if you see it in the command, I mean, in the ministerial task team that is being leading, that has been led by the deputy minister to check if it is possible to have a centralized uh, 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 online learning system because some who are afraid of it, sure. not touch, you know. So I think uh, if, you, if you, you have a centralized system, you know, engineering is similar. Maybe some of those elements might take a lot of resources and equally assist other institutions to cap or even, you know, not expose their lack of uh, uh, infrastructure thereof. I think let me raise those only. Okay. Okay. Can I please uh, one small request? Uh, the participants to mute their mic, switch off your mic. You only do it once. You just switch it off and then it doesn't disturb. Because otherwise we are going to have to name and shame those who, are, who have got their mics on and it's not nice that way. Because I'm able to see whose mic is on. I'm just going to say so and so, please mute your mic. Please, let's, let's just, because we, we, we rely on all the participants to make sure that the meeting flows nicely. So if your mic is on, you are disturbing us, now we hear dogs are now barking there and all of that. Please, uh, because it's not only members, it's everybody else who has logged in here uh, is able to participate. Honorable Boshov. Thank you, Honorable Chair. Um, I want to respond to the uh, three uh, presentations on N and NESFAS. Uh, I, I, I think one should admit that uh, if it is um, compared to what we uh, saw with our first presentation from NESFAS uh, and the answers that the administrator provided, uh, then it has come a, a long way in recovering that uh, institution. And I, I just want to remark that one would hope that this will be uh, continued after administration has ended uh, so that we don't have a situation similar to the um, VUT where uh, administrators had to be brought back uh, repeatedly. Um, so that's just a remark. And on the Con Council of Higher Education and the whole question of online learning, uh, it's to me a little bit ironic that in a time that people say that uh, young people uh, read less and less, this online learning makes it necessary for them to read more and the uh, um, necessity of reading skills, uh, which of course is not the uh, responsibility of higher education, but of basic education, but it is, uh, it is really highlighted uh, by this. And then uh, at SAKWA, um, uh, I was yesterday at the Basic Education Committee uh, meeting and it has similar problems uh, than Uma Lucy, in which there are added responsibilities but budget cuts or in Sakwa's uh, case where um, uh, cuts in, in uh, potential earnings. And I'm a little bit concerned, maybe uh, the CEO they could just comment on this. Um, these institutions, uh, they, they give foundational governmental services and ca capacity which is lost in uh, that sector is not easily to be regained. Is it, um, do, we, do we have a, you know, it's, it's a kind of thing that when you, when you present education, you sell trust 
and are we going to be able to uh, re uh, to keep that trust? That is actually what I'm wondering. And then she just shortly referred to uh, competitors in the private sector. And I, I wondered if she could just say who, who are their competitors in the private sector. I, I actually thought of SACWA as, as something without competition. Thank you, Shay. Thank you so much. Remember, members, these are follow-up questions. And they still have to respond to these questions. So we're left with about seven minutes to finish our questions. Honor uh, Mukasho. Uh, we hi chair am i audible i don't I, I i was very skeptical of putting my camera on am i audible yeah we can hear you okay awesome chair um mine is uh, not a question but a comment um that relates to the issue um with n plus two well students who have been affected by the um the termination well they they've, they've exceeded the n plus two right um there are many queries that have come forth and i think um the administrator randall carlson um is aware of this and i think i want to put it on record chair that um there are many there are many varying matters as to why they find themselves where they are and um NASFIS, um needs to play a, a very deliberate role in ensuring that each case is handled um you know, uniquely. Um, I mean, some students are really complaining about the fact that at the beginning of the academic year, um, they were told they can, they can register. Um, and now, um, just before uh, mid-year exams, they, they, they are told that they no longer have funding. And that's causing a lot of anxiety in the space. Um, and, and, and with the anxiety of COVID, I don't think we need that added particular anxiety. So I, it's just to flag the importance of us um, being deliberate in how we're interacting with the N plus two crisis that's brewing in 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 universities and various institutions. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much. Uh, we've uh, honourable Lizia. Thank you very much, uh, Chairperson. I think uh, I'll also be very short. <clears throat> um, I think uh, uh, my colleagues covered me on other issues, but on on Council for Higher Education, I just wanted to. Uh, given what Professor Mosia was saying, I um, just want to propose that uh, we probably have a joint um, uh, meeting with the um, uh, Minister of Health, uh, Council for Higher Education, pro probably with the, uh, the Portfolio Committee of Health, uh, to deal with this thing of, uh, of nursing. Uh, I think um, a chairperson on Council for Higher Education, of Higher Education, I'm, I'll, I'll be covered there. On, uh, and as far as I think, um, my question, the question that uh, the, um, um, the administrator was responding to, I think uh, I also raised it, uh, the issue of the missing middle. One, uh, I said, um, and I think I'm raising it here because I don't think um, it was it was answered uh, satisfactory. One, I said on the issue of the missing middle, there are, there are those who were initially not um, um, eligible students um, for this. They were part of the missing middle court, but because of um, COVID-19 um, and <clears throat> its unintended consequences, <clears throat> many families will lose their jobs, their businesses and so forth. If those students apply today, or if those students appeal uh, to the NSFAS, do we have uh, capacity and resources to assist those students who uh, have just moved into 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 that thing? On on the appeals, I think Honorable Mkwacha covers me a, a little bit, but on the slide that the uh, uh, Professor Corollison shared, um, uh, he says that they've resolved about 16,000, uh, resolved successfully 16,000 or so, uh, appeal cases um, out of about 20 or so. So there's about 5,000 or so that still needs to be resolved. Is it possible that we get, or those that were rejected, sorry, is it possible that they give us uh, uh, those ones and the reasons thereof, Chairperson? Because um, we are 
um, you know, in our inboxes, we get these students who are complaining that uh, on the portal that, that nothing has changed. They said, I have not submitted documents and I've submitted and nothing has been done. So can we get that thing? On on SACWA, it's clear that uh, things are not looking good financially there uh, for that uh, uh, institution um, <clears throat> because of COVID-19. Maybe Chairperson, we must... Uh, um, when we have a discussion with the minister, speak to him maybe to consider the stimulus or relief funding for SAQA uh, because they are running a very serious end today. Uh, on the, uh, maybe Chairperson, you will share with yeah. us the. Wrap up, uh, Honorable Litsi. I'm wrapping up, it's the last one. <clears throat> maybe you will share with us uh, the responses. Um, because from the that they they sent they said they sent to you on the 14th, but um, from what the slides that the two slides that they shared, um, it looks as if uh, chairperson as a as a portfolio committee we need to um, release a, a, like we did in February release a a a, a press release uh, possibly. Um, uh, apologizing to the the acting DVC there uh, because uh, when when some when when if we leave it hanging like this, uh, the stigma will always uh, be there. It's like somebody saying somebody is uh, is a criminal, um, and the court of law and that person has not been uh, tested in the court of law. The stigma stays. It's like being accused of rape. Uh, that thing does not stay, and it has potential of ending one's career. So uh, I'm I'm lobbying the portfolio committee that we uh, uh, get the the responses uh, that the CEO was talking about uh, shared with us, and possibly look into <clears throat> the into of uh, apologizing. Thanks. Okay. <clears throat> All right, the honourable note data. Please, brief. I don't know if you can hear me, Chair. Huh? Uh, we can hear you loud and clear. All right. Thank you so much, Chair. I think, firstly, if from your office, Chair, if, if we can maybe get a feedback in terms of the Auditor General's report, um, um, office actually reporting to us and briefing us in terms of these entities before they present their APPs. I think if you can maybe give an update and to what is happening when it comes to that. Um, and then secondly, Chair, just going to Anaspas, um, thanks for the comprehensive responses. But I think my general comment to Anaspas, Chair, would say that they need to come back with an APP that is comprehensive, that is conclusive, and that is not ambiguous. And then we need to consider that particular APP. And maybe there needs to be clarity in terms of what process was followed to outsource the APP being developed and who was responsible for that. And the policy and monitoring and evaluation uh, guidelines were they necessarily followed. And then we'll be able to discuss other things that I think we might need to take up as a portfolio committee around TVET uh, disbursements. Um, being aligned to university uh, allowances. But I wanted to ask a question to the uh, administrator. Um, in terms of the TVET's direct disbursement, as well as the university disbursements, those particular uh, institutions disperse on your behalf. Now, do you have a comprehensive report on a monthly basis on how many students were paid out and how many of them were left out? If you can maybe give us an idea in terms of that. Thanks to CHE who has responded in terms of the Waters of Sulu University. But I wanted to check with them, what is their, re, what is their turnaround time uh, when, when uh, applications to consider the accreditation of courses is taken into consideration, particularly for the nursing and, and, and the, um, for the nursing and the, and the Bachelor of Education at, at Waters of Sulu University. And then lastly to Sakwa, there is an answer around the articulation of, of, of qualifications from TVET universities, but you only refer to the Durban University of Technology. Is there no particular policy guideline or any guideline that you get 
um, as an entity to be able to deal with something like that, not just for DUT, but for all institutions. So, for example, if someone is studying in Tswane North Tivet and they want to continue their studies, for example, at the University of Pretoria, is there a particular okay. guideline for all Very universities? Thank you so much, Chair. As you have put it, articulation between TVET and university. No need, for example. Thank you very much. <clears throat> Honorable Ngobo, the last one. Uh, thank yes. you, Chair. Um, Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I will leave the other two, but uh, I will only mention uh, what they were about because they have been uh, uh, asked. Uh, the, the, the problem here is if you are planning uh, inside the question, you, you, you get this tendency of wanting to repeat it. Uh, I just draw a line and say, I, we have a problem with the missing middle. It does need attention. And then go to SAQA and say uh, that 20% uh, uh, budget cut is definitely going to affect um, uh, 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 the, the operations, smooth operations, uh, in terms of them carrying out their mandate. Uh, but then coming to uh, the questions uh, which were remaining, Chair, because I had four, I now have two. Uh, it's the SACWA's salary bill uh, of 106, uh, which is which amounts to about 64%. Uh, what, what is, is, isn't there a guide? Uh, it, 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 it's, to me, it looks like it's, it's, it's huge, uh, 64%. Uh, it, 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 I sh there should be a guide uh, on, the salary, on the salary bill as far as I'm concerned. If I'm right, I, I would like to get a feedback on that uh, when she responds, the ladies, the CEO. Uh, well, the last one, I just wanted to get the uh, how the, 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 they are welcoming uh, the SACWA, the ACQF, African Continental Qualifications Framework. What, what, what is their view? What is their take? Are they welcoming this? Is it going to be beneficial uh, to, to the continent? And 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 the the, the 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 country in particular. Thank you, Chair. Okay, thank you very much, honourable members. Uh, it looks like we were opening another meeting. Uh, I thought that we are just going to be clarified with the questions we raised, but there's additional more questions now. <clears throat> just few things um, on the issue of. Uh, Okay, can we go on? All right. <clears throat> on the issue of qualification of uh, Mr. Matlalela, uh, we did receive a letter after the appearance, after the presentation. In fact, we wrote follow-up letter because uh, SACWA did not clarify the other qualifications, but in the subsequent letter, they did clarify about the foreign obtained qualifications. And uh, of course, we received the apology. Now, <clears throat> uh, that I think is something that the letter will be shared with the members. I just forgot to share it with the, all the members. Uh, we have since written to the university to clear uh, Mr. Matalela of all the allegations that we've received. And members will remember that we did not initiate these allegations. These allegations were brought to us. We asked the university to investigate the allegation. The university was reluctant. That's why we took the initiative to investigate ourselves. And after investigation, we then confirmed that he indeed has the kind of qualification that he claims to have. And therefore, that allegation was without any basis. And we have written to the university. The university, I think, it has also issued a, a public statement uh, in that regard. And therefore, I don't think there is a need for us to apologize for anything because it is not us who initiated the allegations. In fact, we did a good thing by following up on the investigation. Uh, <clears throat> 
allegations of lack of qualifications is a very serious allegation. When somebody said this person does not have a qualification, uh, it's important that we follow up and make sure that indeed uh, the allegation is cleared. And in this instance, we uh, have discovered our findings is that uh, Mr. Matalala does have the kind of qualifications he claimed to have. We have written to him, we have written to the chairperson of council and the university and the matter is, as far as we are concerned, closed. Uh, can I find out from <clears throat> and as far as because the issue of articulations in as far as SACWA is concerned, uh, maybe the question is also relevant to CHE. Uh, the articulation between the TVETs and the university, the point that Honorable Motada was raising, if they can get give us a comment in that. <clears throat> I'm worried about the issue about centralization of the procurement on the gadgets. And I don't know how it works, and I think it's a matter that we can still follow up and get advice on. That uh, there is a a money that has been appropriated by Parliament to the various entities of the department, including NSFAS. But that money is not been uh, spent where it has been appropriated. It is been spent somewhere else. Now, I don't know whether that would be correct, but I'm subject to correction, and I think it's a matter that we will follow up because indeed we did say that whatever that gets done, it's important that we follow the prescripts of the of the Public Finance Management Act to the latter. Um, and I think we will be guided in as far as that is concerned. Now, we do not have enough time for all the responses. It's only five minutes left. <clears throat> Uh, now, I, I will suggest that maybe we uh, we allow a minute each just to do the closing remarks and then the questions, I'm sure you have noted them, you can uh, respond to them in writing and send to the committee secretariat, we will distribute them to the members. We had intended 15 minutes for the responses, but members kept on going on and on and on. So there's no time now for responses. Can we uh, give to Dr. Carol Lissen just the closing remarks? Uh, thank you, Chair, and thanks for the questions. I'll be very brief. Um, so we are going to submit an amended uh, APP. And the cleaning up is exactly because we got somebody on board to assist me. And like I said, it's not outsourced. It's in my office myself. I take personal responsibility for that. The consequence management quickly is that the, the ones that I've mentioned are the, simply the ones that NISFAS initiated. The syndicated fraud, which extends from NISFAS into institutions and sometimes students, has been handed over to the Hawks, um, as I said. The N plus two rule is a very important rule. Uh, we are sympathetic to that. But NISFAS can't afford to incur further irregular expenditure. We have to stick to the rules, but we will take that up. And, and, and we have Tandy Lewin in the meeting, and we'll talk to her. The issue about the missing middle and the COVID hardship, uh, we will have discussions with Tandy offsite on that uh, because we are bound by a particular budget for this year. So if there's going to be additional uh, money made available for additional hardship, it will have to go through a process. Um, centralization of devices, I think. Uh, uh, Chair, uh, that is something that I hope the Minister will provide clarity on tomorrow's conference. So let me stop there and give my colleagues an opportunity as well. Okay. All right. Uh, can we get Professor Musia? Thank you, Chairperson. Um, uh, with the last uh, matter that you raised on articulation, uh, I think uh, we'll request um, the CEO committee between the three councils to actually clean this matter up so that we can be able to respond you know, in a uniform manner uh, as a sector rather than to have, uh, you know, different responses to. First, the, the other matter on the centralization of, uh, of, of the online teaching systems, I think that's a very difficult one. 
the, the committee can discuss it there, but uh, I just don't see it because of uh, the autonomous nature that institutions have in different platforms of teaching and learning and uh, very different kinds of uh, programs uh, unless uh, they fall into one. So uh, the turnaround times really, our normal turnaround times is eight months, uh, but it also depends on whether uh, submissions are all right because it has to go different structures. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Prof. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Eddie. <laughs> thank you, Chair. Um, Chair, we will send uh, detailed responses. I just want to mention that uh, quite a few uh, were comments about our financial situation, so we appreciate the acknowledgement uh, that we are in a financially precarious position, but just to assure members that we are doing everything on our side to incur savings and minimize our expenditure. Uh, and we do appreciate the proposal from Honorable Letsy to, uh, you know, to intervene for the uh, portfolio committee to intervene, uh, you know, with the minister. Um, we acknowledge and appreciate this uh, effort. Um, just very quickly, Chair, um, I will deal with the other things, but the TVET, the articulation between TVET and universities, um, I might not have been understood. Even though our partnership was with DUT, I did mention that the articulation models and the practices that we researched and uh, wrote about in our report covered a number of universities where very good practice was happening. In other places, I mentioned that they haven't Dr. really Reed? taken to scale. Yeah. So Dr. thank you, Chair, and Is thank you for this opportunity. made by Professor Musia that the three institutions, must, the CEOs must meet, look at this, and give us quite a comprehensive uh, response to this because uh, it has got a lot of implication and it's a matter that has been on our table. Let's not handle it in a hurry as we are doing now. Okay, Chair, I just want to say the report is there, so we would welcome feedback after the report as well. Thank you. Okay, let it be presented there where all the where the Commission on Higher Education is there, yourself is there, QCTO is there. Deal with that and then give us the response. Noted, Chair. Thank you very much. Are you, are you done? Yes, I will send uh, written responses to the other questions. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, honorable members. I think this brings us to the end of the meeting. Uh, it was quite a long meeting for the three entities. If you add the two hours plus the three hours, is five hours all in all. But we appreciate uh, the level of engagement. And uh, so we are done with the, uh, the issue of uh, the APPs and the strat plans and the budget for these three entities. Friday, we will be considering the, the sitters. So thank you very much, uh, honorable members. This meeting stands adjourned. Thank you, Chair. Good night. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Thank <laughs> you.